specifically this week, uh, there is something which is, we won't call it a miracle, but it was uh, a highly unusual and a very important initiative that's been taken over months for the purpose of preparing a musical performance for this Friday, September 10th. And Diane's here to tell us why that musical performance is being done, what it is, and how you and others can participate. So Diane. Thanks. Well, we're performing on Friday evening, uh, September 10th, a the Schiller Institute NYC Chorus, I should say, a program uh, on News Day, uh, the, for people who know, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world, that's what's there. And the uh, mass ends, Dona Nobis Pacem, give us peace. Uh, what is somewhat miraculous, which I think Dennis may be referring to, is the fact that after the pandemic, of course, uh, people who know about these things may realize that choruses and chorus rehearsals are uh, just absolutely spectacular for their ability to spread small particles and therefore disease. Uh, and when you have a pandemic, the last thing you want to do is have a bunch of people in a room singing together, which is really tragic because uh, as the chorus was founded, um, what we discovered in this process, uh, as Lyndon LaRouche identified, is you have something that comes together where the quality of the whole is emphatically greater than the sum of its parts but the people who participate in it have a sense of the power of participating in something greater than themselves, but which is also beautiful. And LaRouche had actually described the way the sections would work, where you have some stronger singers and the chorus um, has some singers who are professional, semi-professional, and it has some singers who are brand new, who've never sung before, who came in not knowing how to read music, uh, some not even knowing how to match pitch. The chorus agreed early on that uh, we would not have auditions, that anyone who wanted to put in the work, we would work with and they could participate in the chorus, which is very unusual. So even under the circumstances of having a non-audition chorus work on Beethoven's Misa Solemnis, arguably one of the most difficult choral masterpieces ever composed um, would have been a stretch. But to decide that in spite of the pandemic or perhaps because of the pandemic, that we were going to work on this piece remotely over Zoom uh, where the conductor could not even listen to the chorus because of the varying internet speeds. You cannot have a group of people sing at once. You won't be able to tell what's going on. And some choruses developed various interesting techniques to try and get around that. But at any rate, um, we, we proceeded to actually learn the entire mass. And not only that, to create virtual performances, which require that each singer have enough of a knowledge of their part, enough confidence that they can sing it by themselves against the background to be recorded and then assembled by audio engineers and video technicians. And I mean, the whole thing is really quite something. And I also have to say that um, John Segerson, the co-director of this chorus and artistic director of the chorus, um, managed to create a, a virtual orchestra, which is also somewhat of a, of a miracle. Uh, but at any rate, this has come together. And uh, as part of the concert on Friday night, there will be a virtual performance of the Sanctus and the Agnus Dei, the closing sections of the Missa Solemnis. And we had a discussion earlier today about the power of this. Why is this so appropriate for this moment? And what Beethoven does is really brings you, this is not an outside piece for spectators. The Missa Solemnis is not a spectator sport, even for an audience that's supposedly just listening to it and not singing. You have to work. You have to do work. 
uh, and it gets inside of you. So this question of taking away the sins of the world, uh, you almost feel like you're contemplating and absorbing your own responsibility for the sins of the world. And then the ending, unlike the Ninth Symphony or something very joyous where it's completely triumphant and you um, feel elated, this ends the Dona Nobis Pacem is very pensive. It's very introspective. And I think that that in part is because the listener and the singer and the orchestra have to work. It sort of leaves you in a place where there's a question, or as Lynn talked about the subjunctive mood, are you going to participate in this? Will you become a person who create, makes the um, atonement of mankind, the forgiveness of man's sins possible by your actions, by your identity? So it's a really um, incredibly powerful thing. So the concert on Friday will have those two movements. There will be music that's performed live, but there is no live audience. Uh, the whole concert will be live streamed and information on that is available at sinycchorus.com as in Schiller Institute NYC, sinycchorus.com. It's Friday evening at 7 p.m. Eastern. And uh, if you pay a very nominal fee for the uh, so-called ticket, uh, you'll get a link, which means you can listen to it either live or you can listen to it anytime after it's performed. Um, so I would really encourage people to do that. And I think I'll actually, I'll just say one other thing, because five years ago, the Schiller Institute Chorus um, performed four concerts of the Mozart Requiem and a selection of Negro spirituals on the 15th anniversary of 9-11. And that performance intersected a battle for a bill called, well, to, uh, to release the 28 pages and the justice against sponsors of terrorism against the Saudis. And um, Obama actually had vetoed this legislation, but the Congress voted an overwhelming veto-proof majority. I think maybe only two people voted against it to overturn that veto, which was really fascinating. It was the Justice Against Sponsors of Terrorism Act, which would allow for the Saudis to actually be um, investigated and prosecuted for their role in this. This was extremely important, obviously, for the family members of 9-11 victims and the victims uh, themselves, the survivors of, of those attacks. And the music has to be seen as part of this. And I don't mean some simple thought like it just gave people courage or although I'm sure it did. But again, this question of solidarity and this question of the unity of mankind actually, because while each individual human being is mortal, that is, we are going to die, um, mankind should be immortal. And that's something that unifies us. And that is something that also allows us to um, make our immortality intelligible. I guess I'll put it that way. And I think the music of the great classical composers as well as of the spirituals has that quality. So here we are at another inflection point and with the music of Beethoven, and I think this will be a very important contribution to the ennobling of character that's really required if humanity is indeed to proceed to a new paradigm which is superior to the one that we're currently in. But I have something for you, Diane. This is from one of the uh, people who was involved in uh, assisting, particularly five years ago when we uh, mm -hmm. uh, did the a series of Mozart performances. And the question is, how do we overcome the ignorance of the American people regarding these issues? 
uh, as well as address the problem of the current curriculum that children are getting as being also taught in our universities and general educational institutions around the country? Hmm. Well, that's a tough question uh, because people are really bombarded by a hideously ugly culture. And that's why I think it's so very important that people do participate in choral singing and classical music and learning an instrument, uh, going to the museum, because these things reaffirm what it means to be a human being. I think the thing that's so destructive about our education right now is that there's an underlying axiom that human beings are really nothing more than animals. Uh, and not only that, we're worse than animals because we're destroying the planet by having a carbon footprint or some such nonsense. I mean, I actually think it's unconscionable to tell a child that they are responsible for destroying the planet. I, I can't imagine doing that to a young person uh, because then what's the logical, what would be their greatest contribution then is to eliminate themselves in some way. I mean, it's really evil. So the power of this music, I think, accesses something within people which affirms the beautiful quality of being human, which I think is something, it seems odd enough, I mean, it demonstrates the dark age that we're in, that we actually have to continuously assert and remind ourselves that the human species is a beautiful species and has a great good to contribute to the development of the solar system. To uh, partially help answer that question, we have a uh, short video uh, from a concert that was done in 2018, Diane is conducting. Um, and this is uh, Rally Around the Flag. It's uh, introduced by the late Ed Asner, who passed away on Sunday, uh, who was an uh, associate of ours, and Harley actually will have a few things to say about him. We're going to just show, since Diane brought up what she brought up, let's, uh, let's take a look at this. The time, 1865, the conclusion of the American Civil War. President Abraham Lincoln declares, if God wills that this war continue until all the wealth piled by the bondman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword. As was said over 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Yes, we'll rally round the flag, boys, we'll rally once again. Shouting the battle cry of freedom. We will rally from the hillside, we'll gather from the plain. Shouting the battle cry of freedom. Brothers gone before, shouting the battle cry of freedom, and we'll fill our vacant ranks with a million free men more. Shouting the battle cry of freedom, the union forever. Hurrah, boys, hurrah! Down with the traitor, up with the star. While we rally round the flag, boys, rally once again. Loyal, true, and brave, shouting the battle cry of freedom. And although they may be poor, not a man shall be a slave, shouting the battle cry of freedom. The union forever, hurrah, boys, hurrah, down with the 
Shouting the battle cry. 